I think it's time to start. Welcome everybody to the a new edition of the Risk Two. Okay, it's people entering to the to the meeting. Well, we are about to start. Uh, let me tell you some things about this tutorial, this webinar, new webinar, and let me use this. Okay, here we are with uh, Lufomir and Andre from the IT4 Innovation National Supercomputer Center. They're gonna talk about the energy efficiency of HPC clusters. So it's gonna be a very interesting and useful talk. We have the chat section to for questions. If you have any questions, just write it down there. And we are to have a section at the end of the talk devoted to questions. And, hopefully answers from our guests and reminders for the uh, for the talk keep your mic uh, muted so you your noise is not uh, gonna be shared with the rest of us and we are recording this session and will be then put online in our website in risk to project website so you can return to it or share with your friends colleagues later. If you have any question during the talk and you want to to ask it, just raise your hand with the reactions in your Zoom client and you want to let the speakers know about that and because when you're sharing your screen, this kind of things is uh, difficult to, to see, but we are just monitoring this, this uh, aspect of the talk and we are going to stop the speakers and then let you ask the questions. Okay, I'm gonna give the the air to our guest. I stop sharing my screen and let's start. Okay. Luvomir, with your okay, thank with you. Your so, talk. so I'm gonna start sharing uh, sharing my screen and uh, now we should see my screen is that correct perfectly yes okay okay so and uh, so we split the presentation in, into two parts uh, uh on will start with the first part of the presentation and then i'm gonna finish it uh, finish the, the the second part so i guess Andre you can go ahead and start okay so uh welcome everyone uh we will have uh this uh, overview talk on uh, energy efficiency in uh, HPC. What's, uh, uh, let's say, state of the art uh, and what can you expect when uh, improving energy efficiency of your application? So, first of all, uh, why do we look at the energy efficiency. Uh, several years ago, when uh, we started Sorry, Andre, you mute yourself. Okay, uh, when was it muted? Well, have you heard anything what I've said? Yes, I, I'm hearing you. Uh, continue, before, continue. Before, yeah, just, you, you lost track, uh, some seconds only. Okay, okay. So, uh, when the come, so the motivation for the energy efficiency, uh, one of the limitations when uh, building more and more powerful supercomputers uh, become energy consumption. Uh, we realized that uh, having the same hardware as we had uh, is not possible to get exascale system just because the uh, energy efficiency is uh, divided by power. So if you want to improve energy efficiency, you must improve the performance of the system or reduce power consumption. It's always better to focus on the first part uh, to improve the performance 
And at the moment, when you are not able to improve the performance anymore, then you may look on the power consumption. So mostly, uh, however, the vendors and uh, application um, developers focus on the first part, why, while we at the energy efficiency team uh, or researchers, we we are focusing on reducing power. Uh, reducing power doesn't have to mean that you will reduce performance of your application because your application may not reach, uh, might be limited by the performance of, of your application, may be limited by the hardware. And then uh, Ne never you use all the parts of the hardware. So limit just the specific part of the hardware you are not using. Is it's this is the way how to improve the energy efficiency while uh, not hurting the performance of your application. Now I have here a list of uh, the most powerful supercomputers of the world. So. Uh, this fr from the top of the list uh, of 500 the most powerful supercomputers and uh, beside the performance of these systems there's also uh, power so just recently uh, we have here the very first exascale system eh? you can see that uh, it really met the goal of 20 megawatts using the old hardware, so the systems that were uh, introduced to the list earlier, uh, building an exascale system using the same hardware wouldn't be possible because the power consumption would be extreme. Uh, such an example is so are the systems from China where the power consumption would be over 100 megawatts, which is really, really, really high. Uh, recent hardware is uh, getting to the, to the specified goal, but it was only possible by uh, hardware improvement. And it was due to uh, rising number of cores, uh, using chiplets, using specific units. Uh, for, for example, for matrix uh, multiplication, uh, which is also the case of using GPUs and tensor cores. So really the heterogeneous hardware in the HPC systems are the way how to reach this uh, ener high energy efficiency. However, the application developers are forced to really utilize this hardware, which is really hard. And when the hardware is not fully utilized, then there's again a uh, possibility to reduce power consumption of the hardware uh, without hurting the performance. So here's the Another, there's another list from the top 500, it is green 500, so the list of the most uh, energy efficient hardware. And as you can see, uh, all the systems are using an accelerator. Uh, currently, it's uh, mostly AMD, uh, ME250, while also some NVIDIA. I have uh, here also the previous list where uh, there were many more uh, NVIDIA uh, NVIDIA NVIDIA GPUs. So it's a matter of the recent list. We can ex expect that uh, when NVIDIA Hopper will be more common uh, than uh, there will be again more NVIDIA GPUs at the top of the green package. So uh, that was about uh, hardware. 
Uh, now we'll have a look on the power management and monitoring systems, that, which are go key how to improve the energy efficiency. You must be able to monitor the energy efficiency first and uh, have a way how to improve it. So the some kind some knobs of the hardware that allows to reduce its power consumption. So uh, here's just a list of uh, various uh, vendors with their uh, hardware, so we can see that mostly uh, frequency of the cores and power capping uh, is available on, uh, on any hardware. So these are almost, uh, we can say, standard for uh, for any hardware, and uh, it's a matter of uh, interface. Uh, so any any of the modern hardware can be somehow controlled for power consumption. Uh, in the hardware, there is standard uh, API, uh, mostly designed for uh, CPUs. Uh, so when having on your CPU, you can uh, look for a scaling driver that controls uh, performance states in which the CPU operates. Uh, so this will be the CPU core frequency and uh, the scaling governor, which is under the scaling driver, and decides what performance states will be applied at the moment when the CPU is uh, under a load. Uh, on modern Intel hardware, there's also a hardware feature that controls the frequency, uh, but uh, also this is possible to turn around and control the frequency from the space. So I will go uh, through some of the uh, major knobs of the hardware uh, just briefly and focus on uh, Intel CPUs, which are the most common in the modern uh, HPC centers. So uh, we should start with uh, CPU power frequency, mostly in the uh, uh, turbo, which is uh, each CPU has uh, no, not really each, but uh, each Intel CPU has uh, nominal frequency, which is a frequency for which the, the, the TDP uh, thermal design is specified, and uh, turbo boost are frequency above that. Uh, so we, when CPU, which is uh, well, cooled, which is typical for HPC system, uh, is common. So the CPU is running on the maximum frequency if not uh, forced by a power limit. Uh, just be careful that the maximum frequency of the cores are limited according number of cores that are active and according to the instruction set you are using. So as the image uh, left bottom uh, on the left uh, shows, there are four specific uh, CPUs for, from uh, four different uh, generations. So that's Hustle, Broadwell, Skylake, and Cascade Lake. Uh, when having and see if when having different number of active cores, the limit for the maximum turbo frequency is different. Uh, this is source, potential source of a problem in your application. If you have just an island of vector instructions or 
vector instructions of different instruction set that uh, the CPU might be forced to change the frequency during the application execution, which causes the transition latency. So the, the CPU will stop to execute, change the frequency, then execute the ins vector instructions on its maximum frequency and then it goes back. So uh, this is a potential performance problem of your application. If uh, you are switching the instruction set. Uh, in case of uh, Intel CPUs, there's also Encore frequency. This is a frequency of a subsystem on the physical process of package. So this is a part that is shared by uh, cores. So for example, L3 cache or interconnect of the cores so this is almost approximately 30 par 30 percent of the chip area uh, which has also quite uh, important uh, impact on power consumption in this case you are not so influenced uh, compute bound regions but mostly Memory bound regions when reducing or resetting. Just uh, as, uh, as I said, this is for uh, several, several cores. So, usually one core frequency for a socket. So, uh, you cannot control each core individually for a core frequency. Uh, another thing is power capping or uh, runtime average power limit uh, in case of Intel. So the uh, well-known REPL interface uh, of several power domains, which is in the community mostly used to measure energy consumption. But this is, a, let's say, side purpose because it's uh, designed to uh, limit power consumption of the CPU, so you can, uh, for several domains, uh, control the power consumption in specified time window. It has for the main power uh, power domain as does the package, and it has short and long uh, window. The long window is really tuned, uh, but by the runtime systems where the power limit is specified as the TDP uh, of the hardware, so it's possible to reduce uh, the value. Uh, as I said, it's possible to use this interface also for measuring energy consumption, uh, but you must uh, I realize that this is just energy consumption of the CPU, so one component on the plate only, so the remaining components are not uh, covered by this performance counter. Uh, so this were about Intel CPUs. Uh, I have uh, also two slides about NVIDIA GPUs, it has possibility to uh, control uh, frequency of the streaming multiprocessor that the frequency is tightly connected with the frequency of the memory. However, uh, in H the HPC GPUs use HBM memory, which is not possible to control. Only GPUs with uh, DDR memory uh, provide the possibility to control the frequency of the memory. So in this case, uh, NVIDIA Ampere 100 allows to control the frequency of the streaming the source. Uh, you can see that uh, reducing the energy, uh, the frequency to the level of nominal frequency provides the best energy efficiency 
And so here from the list, uh, when having double or tensor core double uh, instructions, the energy efficiency reaches uh, the over the 50 gigaplops per watt in case of tensor cores is over 90, which is uh, really, really good uh, energy efficiency. But uh, it causes a major uh, extension of uh, the runtime, which is for a case, this is an uh, example of uh, compute bound region. In case of memory bound regions, there is uh, no performance uh, degradation and similar uh, energy savings around 30%. Uh, so these were just a uh, short uh, insight into the uh, knobs of the hardware. Uh, here I had a list of power monitoring solutions, so we can see that there are quite few. Uh, the most well known is uh, Rappel, which is uh, which are the performance counters uh, from uh, NVIDIA, but also AMD CPUs uh, implemented the same interface, uh, a similar similar interface. Uh, uh, NVML is kind of a similar interface. Again, performance counters uh, from uh, NVIDIA, while the rest of the solutions are focused mostly on uh, our hardware solutions. So uh, the performance counters are usually the in-band solution that are vendor dependent uh, and uh, yeah, it, the end band means that you can access it uh, easily from uh, user space. Uh, while in case of the auto band solution, there are specific uh, hardware components that uh, must be exposed somehow to user space. So, uh, advantage band solutions usually are that uh, these. This does not uh, influence the uh, execution of the application since you can uh, uh, destore the power consumption or energy consumption to the, its internal memory and you can uh, access it afterwards uh, when the execution has stopped. So, uh, and the granularity. Uh, it's also usually better than in case of uh, the in-band solutions. So one example of the uh, in-band, audio-band solutions uh, is uh, uh, Atos HD, which is uh, FPGA directly on the on the node, and it really stores uh, thousand samples per second uh, in the internal memory for the whole blade. So it does not monitor just the CPU, as in case of uh, the CPU performance counters or the GPU performance counters. And in addition, it also monitors there are several other domains on the blade. So in this case, our that's our uh, CPUs, uh, uh, memory channels, uh, interconnect, and so. Uh, so this is example of the one of the automated solutions. Uh, now, a list of uh, HPC centers that are really focused on. Uh, energy consumption, energy efficiency. I have uh, been focused on uh, Europe mostly uh, because I we, we know about these centers. So one of them is uh, uh, LRZ in uh, Munich, Germany. 
uh, where their system, which was uh, number eight in 500 when they started to operate the system, and uh, they reduced the power limit of the CPUs about almost 15% by default. Uh, so this is the a configuration that shows better energy efficiency. Another example is uh, Cheka in uh, Italy. Uh, uh, they use the hardware in their uh, maximum configuration. However, uh, any user can access the power management knobs and uh, control, try to control the power consumption of the hardware. And it's just a matter of uh, specifying uh, SLARM flags that will allow to provide uh, the possibilities to the user. And at the end of the job, the uh, configuration is restored. Uh, also, at IT for Innovations, which is uh, our case, uh, so in the Czech Republic, uh, we have two systems uh, providing several knobs that can be controlled by the user, uh, also having uh, several possibilities how to uh, measure energy consumption, and in case of our uh, main uh, HPC system, which is Karina, uh, in the when we started to operate the system, I think two years ago, it was uh, at the edge of top 50 in uh, top 500. So uh, we reduced the frequency of the CPUs and GPUs quite significantly. Uh, not to have just the European centers, uh, also, uh, for quite a long time, uh, number one in the world, Recon, uh, system Fugaku. They have four possibilities uh, that the uh, user must specify. Uh, so the CPU uh, statically at the beginning of the job uh, may work in four different configurations. So uh, it may improve its uh, energy consumption during the job. So uh, here's an example of uh, power consumption of the HPL test for top 500 uh, when uh, submitted to top 500 and to, uh, to green 500, which is possible to. Uh, uh, for green 500, you may optimize the configuration of the hardware uh, to make, become to make the system more energy efficient. Uh, as you may imagine, improving energy efficiency is not just a matter of one level. Uh, there are requirements from the side to from the whole HPC center to some limitations uh, what uh, energy consumption can be uh, and again there could be another level of uh, requirements from the scheduler then from the application level and at the end also from the uh, on the node level uh, from uh, several components. And uh, having this several layers working together could be complicated. Uh, so uh, there started to, to be an uh, initiative called HPC PowerStack that uh, tries to identify how to make all the things running. So this is uh, an image of uh, how the uh, components should uh, communicate. And uh, 
Uh, I know that the Lawrence Livermore National Lab is working on the implementation of this uh, HPC power stack. So this is uh, American power stack. While in the Europe, there's a uh, uh, similar uh, initiative. Uh, while it is the sub branch of the HPC power stack, uh, under the Regala project, uh, they prepare their own uh, implementation of uh, a similar uh, stack of components that should uh, work together on a single system. Okay, I will let Lubomir continue. Okay, thank you. So. I will continue with the with the with the energy of a dynamic tuning. So, so our first experience uh, working with the energy efficiency, working with the energy efficiency and improving the energy efficiency of uh, HPC hardware was uh, the Redex project. The Redex project, the idea was really to exploit the dynamic behavior of the application and try to tune the hardware for a particular workload. And uh, the output of the project was the methodology of the dynamic tuning, but also a set of tools that implement the methodology and uh, they were able to, to use it. So if we take a look at the, at the dynamicity, what do we mean by dynamic behavior of the, of the application? By dynamic behavior of the application, we mean that uh, we can split the application into the phases, and that phase can have uh, can be either either memory bound, which means it stresses the the uncore system of the processor, or it could be compute bound, which means it stresses the the computational core. It could be communication bound, where actually the, the processor is idle and it's waiting for the for the network cards to finish the to finish uh, the, the, the communication, could be I.O. reading the data. So you, your application is going through the phases and each phase has a, has a different type of workload, which stresses the processing units differently. What I have here is actually the, the, the roof line model. And you can see that if we, if we have the, the arithmetic intensity on the horizontal axis, we see that if we increase the intensity, we improve, we increase the, the, the flops, the, the amount of full people operations per second. But as but at the same time, we decreasing the, the, the bandwidth, which is the orange dashed line. So the memory bandwidth as we increase the item is, is uh, decreasing. So it kind of means that if we if we have a low arithmetic intensity, we need fast memory system. If we have higher intensity, our memory system can be slower, but we need the, the, the processor cores to run at the maximum performance. So uh, I have here an example of, uh, of a tuning of the two parameters of the encore frequency, which, is, uh, which are the different lines are represented by the different encore frequency going from 1.2 to 3 gigahertz. And then on the on the horizontal <coughs> on the vertical axis, I have the I have the core frequency going from 1.2 to 2.6 gigahertz. And then I have the, the energy consumption for the different uh, for the different arithmetic intensity. So I start with the ratio of one to nine, which means that I have uh, that I have a compute bound workload. 90% of the workload is compute bound, 10% is, uh, is a memory bound. So I'm on the, on the right side of the arithmetic intensity with the high one. And uh, as I, as, and I have some optimum, which is, uh, which is 1.6 gigahertz anchor frequency, low anchor frequency and high, and 2.5 gigahertz in the high core frequency. So if I start changing the type of the workload, as I have now, like 50% uh, is compute bound, 50% is the memory bound, 
I am uh, slowly increasing the the anchor because I need more power to the to the memory to have the the optimal core frequency. And as I'm going all the way to the to the to the memory to the memory bound workload, I see that I really need a low core frequency. Let's say 1.6, but it could be as well 1.4. But I need I need a higher I need a higher core frequency, which is which is now close to two point eight, the, the the optimal one. So you see that by changing the workload, my optimal from terms of the energy consumption, my optimal configuration changes, and this is something that uh, we exploit in the dynamic tuning. So suppose I have this very very short uh, and simple code where I have a function called Laplace 3D and I have another function that executes the fast field transformation. And these two functions for me are the significant regions. And for each of these functions, I have a different optimal frequency in terms of the in terms of the uh, in terms of the optimal in terms of the power consumption energy consumption. So, so I have uh, my Laplace 3D runs optimally at 2 gigahertz. My FFEW runs optimally at 1.5 gigahertz. So what, what we try to exploit is that we need to find the optimal settings for each of these. And then we want to have some kind of a tool, a runtime system that actually, as we enter the region, we apply those frequencies so that the region is executed at the optimal optimal hardware configuration. Uh, what uh, I have here, let's say I have a again, I have two regions in the application. I have a DGEM, uh, MV, the matrix vector. Multiplication and the German, the MM, the matrix matrix multiplication. The matrix vector is the one that is memory bound. The, uh, the matrix matrix is the one that is a compute bound. And uh, I have the optimal configuration found here for each of these regions. And now I can I I, I can define two types of the tuning for searching the optimal configuration. Either I have a static tuning, which means that I can find that uh, I kind of have the my region are both of these. My region is entire application, and I try to find the optimal settings for the entire application. And if I do that, I I see that uh, I can save approximately nine percent in this simple case uh, of uh, of energy. But if I go for the dynamic, which means that I'm gonna find the optimal settings for the for the matrix vector and then the optimal settings for the matrix matrix multiplications, I can go further and save another another eleven percent. So I can have a I can have a significantly better energy savings. In the Redex, we had a, we had we had a goal that uh, we want to define. How much we save by the by the static savings and compare it to the dynamic savings. So, so within the project we have this uh, this uh, test suite uh, consists of these applications going from uh, from proxy apps all the way to like uh, complex applications like Indeed Express or Open Form. And we've seen that uh, on average we were able to save approximately twelve percent by doing the static tuning. And uh, the minimum was 4.3. 4 the best case was like 17, close to 18 percent in case of the of the low uh, proxy apps. Then, if we applied the, the dynamic tuning, we were able to reach uh, on average 17 percent, 17.5, and in the best case, all the way up to 34 percent in case of the of the BAM4 application. So. These are the differences of between if you do the energy tuning like the without a specific runtime system, just the static tuning that you can use your SORM or any any job manager that can at the beginning of the job can set you the frequency of uh, for the entire job. 
or if you use the advanced uh, the advanced uh, dynamic learning uh, runtime system. So we also did uh, some you know scalability experiments on uh, on one of the codes, uh, the on the espresso, which is finite element uh, tool. You see that this is this is not a, a toy application. It really has uh, a large number of regions. And we we need to find the optimal configuration for each region, and then we did the, the scaling of the application. And uh, at the beginning, for small number of nodes, we were seeing some energy savings, but we paid the extra runtime. But when we did the strong scaling, so towards the end, we see the energy savings both due to optimal utilization of the hardware but also we improve the, the runtime of the application uh, and, improve the, and improve the scalability. This was mainly due to the fact that in addition to the core and the uncore frequencies, we were also uh, tuning the uh, number of threads using in the OpenMP regions. So by optimizing the number of threads for, this, uh, for, the, for the end of the scalability, we find the better configuration that suited uh, that suited both the, the the application and the hardware that that allow us to get better time and the energy savings. So the output of uh, of, uh, of the Redex was the the Merif library, which is the which is the runtime system that provides the the cable capabilities of dynamic application tuning. And this is pretty much the system, that the, this is pretty much the, the tool that we are using up to now. We constantly improving that by adding the support for the for the new architectures. We started with the x86. Uh, and then we added the support for the IBM power architecture, several ARM processors, and uh, currently we are working on the support of the NVIDIA GPUs. Right now, we'll support the static tuning and the dynamic tuning is uh, is under the development. Another important thing is uh, that you cannot tune the energy if you cannot measure the energy consumptions. So we have to we have to implement the support for the several for the several power monitoring systems. So the one that is the most common and it's on every Intel and AMD CPU is the Rappel. It's been mentioned. In case of the of the IBM power, we have the OCC and the support for the HD. It has also been introduced. NVML is a wrapper like interface for the for the NVIDIA. And currently, we are also working on the A sixty four FX processor, which is the which is the heart of the of the Fugaku machine in Japan. So the Merit is pretty much focused to support all of these. And uh, as of now, we are we are supporting the MPI, OpenMP, and as I was mentioned, the, the CUDA parallelization, and also Fortran, C, C++, and the Fortran. So Merrick, in terms of the tuning, supports these, uh, these parameters. So for the Intel, we can do the core. On core, we can set up the power capping. For the accelerators, uh, Intel accelerators, previously, we did some testing on the KNL. Uh, we are also developing uh, the support for the, the Ponte Vecchio. Uh, since we are a part of the Lumi Consortium, we are also working on the support for the, for the AMD. And as I was already mentioning, we have support for the NVIDIA, NVIDIA GPUs. So these are the list of the... It's mostly, mostly would be, would be focused on what these vendors allow us to is tune the core frequency. If we if then tuning the encore frequency or some related uh, knob that somehow affects the the memory subsystems, and the third knob that we're using is uh, is the power capping. And some of the system give us all three types of these. Some of the system give us only a subset of these. In order to be able to uh, present the the dynamic behavior of of the applications, we have developed the radar visualizer. So it is a, it is a tool that uh, reports the performance, but it is mostly focused on uh, being able to report in uh, in one screen uh, 
large number of configuration, a large number of execution with a different configuration of the same of the same application. So we see how the application behaves when we tuning the supported hardware frequency. Uh, and uh, in addition to that, if we have a, a power system like the AG that is able to provide, uh, that is able to sample the power consumption at a, at a certain rate, we can we, we support the, 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 the <coughs> we support the displaying the the sampling the samples in uh, in a power timeline. So we see how, how the power consumptions behave over time. Uh, Merrick is uh, not the only runtime system that uh, that we are aware of. In uh, in the Europe, there is uh, AR developed at the BSC. We are closely collaborating with the University of Bologna and Chineka, where they are developing the countdown system that is mostly developed on optimization of the of the blocking MPI communications. There is at, Lo at Lawrence Labor Relation Lab, there is development of the of the conductor and the commercial tool that is developed by the Atos is uh, is the BDPO. In each of these systems they work slightly differently. For instance, uh, BDPO is based on the sampling. It samples it samples the, the the performance counters and based on the performance counters is the decides what frequency to apply. Countdown whenever you have you entering a blocking MPI call, the countdown underclocks the frequency just to save just to uh, to lower the power consumption of the processor while doing essentially nothing and just waiting for the for the communication to be to finish. Uh, under the the Alpex project, which is which has a which goal is to develop uh, a European. Exascale pilot platform. We collaborating. Merrick is collaborating with uh, with Countdown it's because Merrick can tune the the execution part of the application while the Countdown can optimize the communication part of the application. So there is natural collaboration that we can exploit and provide even even better results. Yeah. So as I was mentioning the. The work that we presented was initially developed under the Redex project. The support for our IT4I system it's, has been mostly funded by the large research infrastructures of the Czech Republic. And we also offer our tool and the analysis of the energy efficiency under, under the POP project. And we use it to improve, improve the, the performance of the uh, of different codes under the, under the, for example, under the scalable project or other or or other centers of excellence that are currently currently active. And I was already mentioning the LPEX project, which kind of uh, covers the the development of the tool and its integration with the with the countdown tool from uh, from University of Bologna. And with that, I would like to thank you. And uh, if you have any question on us, please uh, go ahead. Thank you both for your impressive presentation. It's really, really nice your work. Uh, let me check if we have anyone, any question in the chat. Okay. If not, I have a couple mine. Okay, I, I start with mine. And okay. if any uh, any guest is a, is a, uh, can can make their own in the chat. Uh, I'm if I'm a sysadmin, an administration of a small cluster or medium-sized cluster, not a top ten cluster like the ones you 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 are dealing. What is your recommendation about uh, starting to incorporate these kind of tools in the day-to-day -day operation of a cluster? So. Mostly the clusters are using a scheduler. The SLARM is uh, SLARM, say, yes. The SLARM is, is the de facto standard, yes. Yeah. Uh, we may go the way as Chineka do. They provide their plugin for SLARM that uh, allows uh, to users to 
control the curriculums. It's uh, available on their Git uh, repository. So any sysadmin may download that and apply to their scheduler. Uh, so users may control the, the calls and uh, uh, it should be safe if uh, not sharing the node uh, with other users that uh, the system will uh, go back to the default configuration at the end of, uh, of the job. So this and, could and be the one, one of the first steps uh, I would go when uh, uh, trying something in energy efficiency. And also, Thank I mean, you. this and, would and, be and enabling, yes. enabling the, the our tools, but another important, another quite easy and usually what we see as a first steps in many centers is that you, when you're submitting a job, you can specify a frequency for that entire job. That's what we use, what we call the static tuning. So you know that your application is memory bound. Okay, let's just run my CPU frequency on a half, and I'm not not gonna use any. I'm not gonna lose any performance or very very few ones. So I mean, just by allowing this, that the swarm because it's running as as with the uh, elevated privileges. So you can you can tune the hardware by by the scheduler. So just applying these would be like the very first step that you can do when. Uh, and then your users can run single job multiple times with a different configuration and find out which of the configuration is, is the optimal one. Yeah, another important thing is exposing the energy consumption of it. So uh, uh, at least providing the performance counters of the hardware components and maybe also from the other levels. So monitoring of the node consumption of direct consumption of the whole cluster if uh, we would be uh, considering uh, reducing energy consumption of the system. Thank you. I have another one. Do you think it's a, a, a possible policy to assign time in a cluster just in, in place of assigning time, assigning energy? I mean, a, a, a user asks for some amount of energy to use in the cluster independently of the number of nodes you know I, I want to use just this amount of energy and you grant me this amount of energy in place of time so Do you think it's, it's technically it's a good idea technically it's very well doable i mean it just you instead of uh, counting the hours you will be count or seconds you will be counting the joules you have the power you have the energy consumptions but this is mostly the political this is the mostly the political view. I mean, how how the people decide uh, what how they wanna enforce it. I mean, as long as you are providing the users with the with the core hours, they want their job to be as fast as possible because that's what they, they're paying for the time. If you would give them some motivation to be more energy efficient, uh, yeah, they will they will probably start thinking about it. But if if only thing that they will get by being damaged efficiency that their jobs will not be as fast as they used to because they underclock too much the the motivation is not is not there first of all you must start to provide them the information about the energy consumption of their jobs and uh, as an example i would like to mention a looming system uh under system this is uh, number three in the in the world i think they specify a limitation for the storage. So every project must specify a terabyte hours. So for how long you will store the, your amount of data on the, on the storage. So this is uh, kind of uh, similar. Uh, another limitation the user must be get used to, uh, to say reliably that uh, we will need so much uh, terabyte hours for our computation. So your first advice is adding to the end of the shop a, a, a message or mail, automatic mail, telling, okay, you, you use this amount of energy in your shop just to start preparing them to, to be a, a, 
have conscience about the, the amount of energy they are using in their shops? Yeah, uh, email or if you have some web system that uh, uh, has the budgeting for, for the jobs, yeah, it's, it's uh, I would say, a good approach to start adding. Yeah, but from... usually in the small scale cluster, you have users and it's not so formal the the amount of time you you give to the users you just say okay you run and they, they compete for the for the scheduler to to access the nodes and they just put yes 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 and whatever you can give me i use or and don't even mind sometimes about the scalability of their cost or the of the scenario they are using so telling them you are wasting this amount or using wasting this amount of energy, it can be a good starting point to for most of our small scale clusters and, and sysadmins. And the, the plugin you mentioned can be a way to, to start monitoring and, and getting that information because by default, you don't get, they get that information. So let me check if, if I have another another question and then I, I, I gonna... Okay, uh, here we have a, a, a question from the people. Let me close it. Uh, the, I, yeah, Juan is asking if you can say something again about over a little bit further on the energy consumption of data table analytics with AA, ML, DL in HPC clusters, if possible. I mean, if you know, I think if you know about the energy consumption in machine learning applications? Well, we may say that uh, machine learning, uh, at least we may expect that machine learning uh, codes are using uh, the tensor cores uh, in case of the GPUs and uh, uh, latest uh, Intel CPUs also have support for uh, matrix uh, uh, multiplication. Uh, so these, I, I cannot tell about the Intel, but I don't have experience with that yet. But uh, in case of the tensor cores, these are the parts that uh, consume a high amount of power, really. It uh, goes at the TDP of, of, the, of the GPU, which uh, actually GPUs are really way more energy efficient and compared to CPUs. So if you have a load on the GPU, it uh, doesn't really mean that uh, the GPU is running on the TV, TDP, which is not, in case of CPUs, it's uh, it's getting close usually to, to the TDP. In case of compute bound region, it's for sure that it's running on the TDP. While on the GPUs, it's really hard, quite, not, not really hard, but quite hard to get to the to the TV, and in case of the, the tensor cores, it gets to the to the power limit. So we may say that it really uses uh, the hardware at the at its maximum. And we didn't do any testing as of now, really taking any any ML framework and try to do the the tuning to really figure out. I mean whether. What would be the performance penalty if we start underclocking the GPUs? Unfortunately, we don't have the data right now. Okay, thank you. I, I think this answers the questions. There was no request from uh, from users, I would say. Um, so that's that's why. And I think this is the last one for the moment. At, at last, uh, let me uh, any personal recommendation to implement energy measures for core GPU and core consumption per shop ID in the on shared nodes. How how do you deal with shared nodes in for energy efficiency? Well we just recently allowed to share nodes uh, since our uh, major system Karina uh, has uh, eight GPUs per node. So in that case, uh, some users do not uh, use all the eight uh, uh, GPUs. So we provided the possibility to share the node and I use just a subset of the, of the GPUs. So we do not have much experience with that. 
But, uh, well, in case of having uh, AMD CPUs, there's accounting per, uh, per CPU core. So uh, this uh, could be possible in case of AMD. In case of uh, uh, CPUs of uh, other vendors, it would be more complicated. Then I would go by evaluating uh, load of each uh, CPU and uh, according the load, evaluating uh, the fraction of the power consumption of the CPU uh, and getting the energy consumption per user accordingly. In case of sharing GPUs, yeah, again, probably the same way, Try, trying to evaluate the load uh, that has been uh, performed by, by each user. In this case, it would be more complicated, but uh, sharing a GPU by several users, uh, I don't have experience with that. And essentially for the GPU, you can tune the frequency of the entire GPU. Yeah. So you cannot tune your like streaming multiprocessors and stuff like that. You only you only get the, the power consumption, uh, the, the you only can tune the frequency of the entire GPU. And the same goes for the unquote frequency. You can you have one single unquote frequency for uh, entire socket. So all the CPU cores at one are working with one unquote frequency. And then you can go and you can tune the core frequency independently. But the anchor frequency is only one for the entire subnet. Okay, thank you. Let me check if we have. Okay, this was the last question. I don't have any more from myself. So let me thank you for this uh, interesting talk, for your time. And let me share some information about the next. So I'm gonna stop sharing so you can share your screen. Yes, yes, I think I can stop by myself. Okay. It's taking the time, okay. Well, we have, we are almost in the end of the of this meeting. Let me thank you for for being with us, and we have a new one at the end of May, uh, same time, same day. Uh, it's gonna be about addressing the challenge of scientific visualization in exact scale age, which is a, a quite interesting topic also because you can run in a large cluster, you get a lot of data, and how do you analyze, explore? This, uh, this large amount of data. So it's gonna be it's one of the hot topics for, for our field also. Well, thanks again, guys, for, for being here, for your interesting talk. And this, this, all this webinar gonna be po uh, posting our webpage in Risk2 Project. See you in the next time and bye-bye.